Good morning, church. That's right, and all the time, God is good. We are so glad to be here, and I want to tell you that I am so glad to be out of jail. Uh, Gene and I are very sorry that we weren't able to be with you here last week. Uh, during the week before Christmas, at least twice that we know of, we were exposed to someone who, who tested positive for COVID. And uh, at least uh, here, our second annual COVID Christmas at the Beam House, we've gotten the order a little bit better. We got it after Christmas this year, but it was very mild, and we're doing great, and we're just glad to be here with you, church. It's good to see you. Um, I'm grateful to Donald Hensey for stepping in for me at the last minute last week, and uh, please don't tell him this, but I think he did a really good job filling in. Uh, if you do tell him, I'll, I'll of course, deny it. Um, I love the fact that he talked to us about the ministry of reconciliation that God has given us as followers of Christ, that he's given to the church. And really, that's kind of what I'm going to be talking with you about. I'm blessed to be here over this week and the next three Sundays after. And what I want to try and do is prepare you, prepare the church for this coming year. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the church. We're going to talk about how the church fits into God's plan for redeeming creation, for fixing this dying world that we live in. And along the way, what I hope to do also is maybe to clarify for you a little bit this whole idea of a pastor search process, right? Hopefully, after January, you'll have a better idea individually of how you can be involved in this process because I'm telling you, that it's not just the search committee that you're going to elect that is responsible for finding your next pastor. Let me say that again. Every single person sitting that's a member of this church that's sitting in a pew, that's sitting at home watching this, you have a responsibility in this process. You have something to do. And hopefully in the next few weeks you'll get a better idea of that and give you some constructive things that you can be doing as a part of this search. So today what I want to do is begin to answer a question that I think might be on some of your minds, and that's this question. My pastor is gone, so now what? Now what? And I know that some of you have been through this type of thing before. In fact, some of you have been in this church long enough that you've been through the process multiple times right here in this very church. All the way back with Brother Gene Tipton and even before Brother Gene, perhaps. Some of you this morning, this might be the very first time you've ever been a part of a church that doesn't have a lead pastor. In fact, knowing Chris like I do, I imagine there are some people here that Chris Moore is the only pastor you've ever known. Under his ministry, you came to know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. Maybe Chris even baptized you. And I know there's some people like that this morning, and you might be a little bit anxious about it. You might be wondering, what am I going to do now? You know, some people is like, well, my pastor left and went to another church. Well, I can maybe go to that other church. Well, you can't do that for Chris, can you? The good part about it is Chris and Jody are still here close by us. So what I want to do today is try to help you understand that question. So I want to ask you, turn your Bibles to Joshua, the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. And what I want to do is share from you in this chapter about what God might be saying to us. I want to invite you, if you're able, would you stand with me as we read God's word together? And I'm going to start reading in, in verse 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's also going to be on the screen as they follow along with me. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory." No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. 
Only be strong and very courageous. Being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Then you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Pray with me, please. Father, I thank you this morning for your word that sustains us. And we come to you with a very simple prayer. Lord, what we do not know, please teach us. Lord, what we need and do not have, please give us. And Lord, what we are not, please make us. By your word, through the power of your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I think it's, it's very important when we study scripture to understand the context of a passage. I, I didn't just pick out a passage, and I don't want to just make some thoughts of my own to you. Because listen, what God has to say to us through this text is way more important than anything that I could say. You hear me? So we need to understand what God is saying to Israel to see what he is doing for Israel in this text that we've read. And only then we'll be able to see maybe what God might be talking to us about this morning. So let me just give you some background. I know you may be familiar, but um, God had used Moses at this time to lead Israel out of Egypt. They've been there for some 430 years, much of it uh, at the end spent in slavery and God had used Moses to lead them out of Egypt. If you remember across the Red Sea, part of the Red Sea, they walked across it. And they'd walked across the desert and headed to the promised land, Canaan. And once before, they had reached the banks of the Jordan River on the edge of the promised land. And Moses at that time, he sent out 12 spies and said, let's go check out the land. And they came back and they said, "Wow, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at the fruit of this land. It said, here's a cluster of grapes, and it's so big they had to carry it on a pole between two men. What a great land that God has given us. Now, 10 of those spies came back and said, but here's the problem. Those people over there are really big. They're powerful. We're, there's no way we can take them. We, we just need to go back. Two of the men, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, this is the land that God has given us. We need to trust him. We need to go into the land, and he will lead us to conquer these people. Unfortunately, the people of Israel listened to the ten instead of the two. And as a result, God caused the Jews to wander around the desert for some 40 years. It's long enough so that everyone in the generation of those, those ten spies died. The only exception was Joshua and Caleb. Later, while they were wandering for 40 years in the desert, Moses got angry with the people. Why did he get angry? Because they were complaining again. We're thirsty. There's no water to drink. And God said to Aaron and Moses, tell the rock to give water to the people. Now, Moses is a great man, but I think he's probably a lot like you and I. He was tired of hearing the frustrated complaints of these people. And so instead of telling the rock, remember what he did? He struck the rock. Now, God is faithful. God gave the people the water they needed. But because of their disobedience, God said to Aaron and Moses, you're not going into the promised land. Somebody else is going to take the people there. And so here in Joshua chapter 1, the Jews once again have come to the banks of the Jordan River. They're about to cross over. Now, Moses and Aaron have died. Joshua has become the leader in Moses' place, and God is here in our text giving Joshua instruction. Here's what you need to do as you lead these people into the promised land. And so I want, you, I want us to see this morning, here's what I think God is saying to the people of Israel in this text. First, in our passage, what we see is there's been a change in leadership. Change in leadership. Moses has been replaced by Joshua as the leader. Now, if you're reading in your scripture, you'll see this in Deuteronomy chapter 3. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, God begins to talk to Moses and he says, listen, 
I want you to encourage and strengthen Joshua because he is going to be at the head of the people. He's going to lead them into the promised land. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 31, this leadership change is formalized. We read that God says, but, um, and the Lord said to Moses, behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may commission him. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. There was a change in leadership. And what I want you to see is this is a visual change of leadership. The people saw this. They knew Moses. They knew Joshua. They would have seen them go into the tent of meeting. They would have seen the Lord descend in the pillar of the cloud. And so it was clear, hey, Moses is out. Joshua is in. He is our leader. And just as God had been with Moses, he would now also be with Joshua. Notice also in our text that the mission of the people of Israel has not changed. The leader has changed, but the mission is the same. God is still giving them the promised land. Let me ask you a question. Do you think God had uh, the right, or he certainly had reason to change his mind about the promised land of the people of Israel? Oh, my goodness. I don't know about you, but I identify with those people of Israel quite a bit. It, here they, they'd come out and look at all the things they'd seen. They'd seen God conquer the Egyptian army by, by opening the Red Sea. They walked through, and then the Red Sea came on the, the Egyptian army and killed them all. God had provided them with food in the wilderness, hadn't he? They said, we're hungry. Why'd you bring us out here to starve? And God said, okay, I'm going to give you manna. You're not going to have to uh, do anything except get up every day and pick up enough to eat. And they complained about that. They said, we're tired of this man. Give, something, give us something to eat. We need some meat. God said, okay, I'll give you enough meat. I'll send enough quail that'll come out your nostrils. They complained. They complained. They complained. They complained about Aaron and Moses and their leadership. Moses went up to, to get the Ten Commandments. And what did the people do while he was gone? They built a golden calf and began to worship it. God had reason to say, you know what, I changed my mind about you folks. But you know, our God is a promise-keeping God. He is just and he is true. And he promised that he would give that land, and here he is following through with that promise. He's keeping the promise. This is a promise that he made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. You remember that? God called Abram and he said, Go from your country and, and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you see God's promise here? Right? God's promising. He's working on. He's plan, carrying out a plan to fix creation. And this is something we saw also all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. You remember after the man and the woman had disobeyed God and ate of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God was bringing judgment. And what does he say to the serpent? He says, look, I want to put enmity between your offspring and the woman's offspring. He will, what? Bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, the heel wound that the offspring of the woman would receive would be a, a non-mortal wound. He would not die. But the wound to the head that the serpent's offspring would receive would be a mortal wound. It would bring death. This is what theologians call the proto-evangelium, which literally means the first good news. This is a picture of the gospel. The offspring of the woman is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would come. And, and the serpent's offspring thought, we're putting him to death. And it's over. We conquered. But it was not a mortal wound because he rose from the grave. Amen? And in the end time, when Jesus returns, that mortal wound will be carried out on the serpent's offspring. His head will be crushed. 
God is carrying out his plan. The mission has not changed. He's working to redeem all of creation to himself. Listen, sin had come into the world through the one man, Adam. And since that time, our world has been broken, right? All of sin that falls short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. We've got a problem, folks. It's a sin problem. and We can't fix it. But here in Joshua 1, what we see is that God is working to keep his promise and he's carrying out his plan to bless all of the families of the world through Abraham's descendants. And Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is that promised blessing. He will come from the nation of Israel, come from the tribe of Judah. He will be a descendant of Abraham. And Jesus will come. He'll live a sinless life. He'll die on the cross for our sins. He'll be buried and he'll raised again on the third day. Amen. This is what God is doing. Even though there had been a change in leadership to Israel, the mission had not changed. God's plan had not changed. Not only was the mission unchanged, I want you to notice that the method hadn't changed either. God's instructions to Joshua are the same instructions that he'd given to Moses. He said, look, pay attention to the scriptures. Study the scriptures. Here he tells Joshua, meditate on them day and night. Don't let the book of the law depart even from your mouth, right? But he says, don't just study the scriptures. What does he tell them? Follow them. Obey the scriptures. God said, be careful to do according to all that is written in it, right? Don't go to the left or to the right. Obey what is written in the scriptures. The psalmist said, the, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And God is telling Joshua, follow the path that my word has laid out for you as you lead these people in Israel. You see, the method is simple to understand, but I don't know about you, sometimes it's hard to carry out, isn't it? It's pretty straightforward. Know what God commands and then obey what God says. Finally, even though the leaders changed, the message has not changed. God reminds Joshua over and over, be what? Strong and courageous. In fact, the second time in our text, he says, be strong and be very courageous, right? God's message to the Jews had been very consistent. He said, look, I'm with you. God said, look, I have chosen you. God said, I love you. You are my people. And don't be frightened because I'm with you. But don't miss this part of God's message. Success comes when you follow God's direction. You see what he said to Joshua? Don't meditate on the law. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Don't go to the left or the right. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. It's like the prophet Samuel said, Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Right? So, here is what our text meant to the Jews. Joshua is your leader. God has put him in leadership over you. Follow him like he did Moses. And the mission's the same. You cross that Jordan and you defeat those enemies that live in the land and you take possession of the land for my glory. And the method hasn't changed. Hey, obey the scriptures. And the message is the same. I am with you. Now with that understanding, we can try to maybe make some sense of what God might be saying to us here at Second Baptist Church in our situation today. Uh, but I want you to understand, first of all, when you look at Scripture, especially when you're studying the Old Testament, Israel is not the church. The church and Israel are not synonymous, right? They're both God's chosen people, but they are two completely different things. This is what Paul is talking about in Ephesians. Right When he says that Christ is our peace, that he has broken down the walls between the Jew and the Gentile, and he says, creating one new man in place of the two. So the church is, is different from Israel. But even though the church is not the same, I think that there are still some things that God is saying to us through this Old Testament passage. So let me just tell you, Second Baptist Church, you have lost your leader, but not your founder. You've lost your leader, but not your founder. Moses, the under-shepherd, was replaced by Joshua, the under-shepherd, 
but the Lord who is the shepherd was still in charge. Chris Moore, the under-shepherd, has left Second Baptist Church, and eventually he'll be replaced by a new under-shepherd. But listen, the good shepherd is still ahead of this church. And we can't forget that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is the founder of this church, and he is still here. And you ought to be encouraged because, listen, even though your former pastor has answered God's call to the Texas Port Ministry, you still have solid leadership in place here at this church. You have a great staff. You have a great deacon body. You have strong leaders in other positions serving here at this church. And listen, best of all, God has placed the Holy Spirit not only in your leaders, but in every one of you who calls Jesus Lord and Savior. The Lord is with you. You may not have a pastor, but your shepherd is still here. Second, your mission has not changed. Just because you don't have a lead pastor right now doesn't mean your mission has changed, right? I, I love that your mission is reflected in the motto here at your church. For the glory of God, by loving God, loving others, and making disciples. I love that. Please hear me this morning. When I say your mission is still the same, you are to fulfill, to fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Go and love your neighbor as yourself. And love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? You know what to do. And friends, there's no reason not to continue doing it. Sometimes there's a, ten a tendency on the part of church members or a church that when we're th they're without a pastor, they say, well, we need to pause things, right? We need to hold on because, you know, we don't have a leader in charge. And, and my question is, what? Why? Why? Listen, the role of the pastor is to make sure that the saints are equipped to do the work of the church. We get confused on that sometimes. And listen, your former pastor did a really good job of that. I hope you see that, because I do. You are well equipped to keep doing the work of the church. There's going to come a time in the future when maybe the strategy or maybe the details of how you carry out your mission may change. This happens because communities change, because our culture changes around us, right? The message and the mission is the same, but how we do it may change. And I want you to know that I know for a matter of fact that God is going to provide you with the right pastor to shepherd you through any changes like that when the time is there. God will do it. He did it for Israel. I guarantee you he'll do it for you. But for right now, listen, there's no reason to stop doing what you're doing. Love God. Love others. Make disciples. Just as Israel had marching orders to cross over the Jordan and take the land, listen, Jesus has sent you, Second Baptist Church, to tell this community the good news of Jesus Christ. Third, the way that you are to approach your mission hasn't changed either. Listen, continue to make disciples like you're doing now. Preach God's word. Teach God's word. Gather together to worship God in spirit and in truth. Model God's word by living in obedience to all that Jesus commanded. Listen, you've been talking about doing life together now for a couple of years, haven't you? Continue to live life together just as you've been studying and preparing to do. And finally, the message that God is telling you hasn't changed either. God told Joshua to be strong and very courageous. Well, don't be afraid because Jesus said, I'll be with you until the end of the age. He is with you. Go and preach the gospel to all of creation. Tell them that Jesus died on the cross for their sin. He was buried and rose again on the third day to bring new life. I want to finish up this morning by taking a look at what's ahead of you in the coming months. If we look at the near term, and by that I'm talking about, about January, this month, here's what we're going to do. This afternoon, we're gathering together to do a memories, church memories workshop. 
And I pray that you've been thinking about this all week long and preparing. And I hope that you'll come and be a part of that this afternoon. Because what we're going to do is we're going to look at the last 30 years of God's activity at Second Baptist Church of Anglican. Some of you have been there for all that time. Some of you are relatively new. You're all important and you're all needed. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to come and we're just going to mark out those things, those experiences, those times that we've seen in the last 30 years. And we're going to look for God's activity in the good things, in the bad things. Because when we, when we look, I know some of you have taken experiencing God. Henry Blackaby talks about spiritual markers in your life. When you look backward and see God's activity, it kind of gives you a vector and a direction to look forward to see where God may be taking you. And it works for individuals, but also works in the life of a church. And so that's what we're going to do this afternoon. Look at those things and recognize God's activity in Second Baptist Church of Angleton. And say, God, help us to see where you're taking us. Sometime this month, you're going to elect a pastor search team. And I think you've got a handout. You've been talked to about that, about the times and all that. But you're going to elect some folks to be a part of this search. And while I'm here the next few weeks, as I said, we're going to talk more about the church. We're going to talk about the mission of the church and what God has got in store. Midterm, looking forward in the next couple of months, February and March, when you've got your team selected, we'll figure out a time and I'll, be, I'll begin to train them on the whole pastor search process. We'll start through that with them. But most importantly, what you'll do is you begin to put together a concerted prayer effort. Now, you've already started that. I love how you're spending your time in the worship service praying. I love the prayer guide that you've been handed. The most important part of this process is going to be prayer. It's prayer. Listen, this is not about searching for someone to fill an open position. I worked in, in the industry for a lot of years. Some of you, I know, have worked probably in the plants or in other areas of ministry and you are in the industry, and you know what it's like to hire someone. You look for qualifications. You put it out. People give you resumes. You see who meets the resumes. You do interviews. I like you. I think you'll succeed. We hire you. And there are going to be a lot of this pastor search process that's going to seem like that, and there are parts of it they have in common. But understand this, folks. This is a spiritual process. We're not hiring someone to fill a position. You're, you're, you're discerning who God has called to be your next pastor. And as a spiritual process, the most important part of it is prayer. It's prayer. And so you'll set that up in the next couple months and begin to pray. Also, I think you begin to talk about an interim pastor. Hopefully your leadership, your church council, your deacons, whatever your structure is, will begin to talk about, do we need an interim pastor? What can an interim pastor do for us? Personally, I, I think it would be good for you to think about calling an interim pastor, somebody to come in here on a consistent basis so that when you walk into this church, when visitors come to the church, they see the same person in the pulpit preaching to you week to week. Somebody that is an experienced person pastor maybe retired that you can benefit from their wisdom and their experience to walk with you in this journey to prepare you to help the search team through this process i hope you'll do that ultimately that's the church's decision you've got to decide what's best for you and do it but i hope that you will and then the long term 12 months i hope that doesn't scare you kind of the rule of thumb for a pastor search is basically one month for every year of the former pastor's tenure well, Chris was here, what, 13 years? So you're looking at a year. It's not unusual for a church to search for a year to 18 months. And that may seem scary, but listen, you had your marching orders. You know what to do, right? You're equipped to do it. You've got the leadership to do it. So don't let it scare you. In fact, this is an exciting time. This is evidence of God's activity. Listen, when when God called Chris and, and Jody and James to leave here for Chris to go to Texas Port Ministry, do you think he wasn't thinking about Second Baptist Angleton as well? He's got something in mind for you. So it's an exciting time. So you're going to keep doing what you've been doing, making disciples, worshiping the Lord, caring for each other, serving this community, being on mission, and being the church that God has grown you to be, living life together. You're going to pray. You're going to be obedient to whatever God says, whenever he says to do it, all right? As we come to a time of invitation, let me just say this. Church members, we're going to open up the altar here in a minute. 
for a time of, of prayer. And I want to invite you to come and pray. I know we did it at the beginning of the service, but we can come and do it again. Come and pray for Chris and Jody and James and pray for Texas Port Ministry. I know some of you are hurting, but I, but I know this is tough on, on James. Because this is all the church he's ever known. He loves his church. Pray for him. Pray for Chris and Jody because they love you too. Pray for the search team that's going to be chosen. Pray for this process. And, and as we prayed earlier, pray for the pastor that God has already chosen. And if you've got, maybe you have some prayer needs. I'm going to be down here. I would love to pray with you. Uh, some of your deacons and other people will be here as well to pray with you. But church members, you come up and pray. You come and pray. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Listen, I hope this morning uh, that as you've been here, you'll recognize a couple of things. Number one, it's not a coincidence that you're here. I don't believe in coincidence or accidents. I believe in God's providence. And for whatever reason, you happen to be here this morning. And I hope that as we studied this passage, what you've seen is that God is actively involved in the life of his people. Our God is not a God who created things and then just took off and left it be. He is actively involved in the world today. He's been working throughout the ages to fix this broken world. And can I just tell you, you don't have to be a Christian to see that this world we're in has got something wrong with it, do you? You don't have to be a Christian to understand that there's something broken here. What's wrong with this world is sin. And ever since it came into the world through the one man, things have been broken. Sin brought death. All of sin that falls short of the glory of God. And friend, that includes you, that includes me, that includes everybody in this room. The wages of sin is death. But. That's my favorite word in the Bible. But. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, friend, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He sent his son and he died on the cross for our sin. He took your place, he took my place that we would not, we would not have to pay the penalty for our sin. Paul writes it like this, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that in him we might, we might become the righteousness of God. And so this morning, friend, if you don't know Christ, I want you to understand that that can change today. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved, right? Because it's with your heart that you believe and you're made right with God. It's with your mouth that you confess and you're saved. And the Bible promises that all, how much is all? Everybody, everybody, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you stand with me as we pray this morning? Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, it, it was true and it was important and it had meaning for the people in the Old Testament. And it's true and important and has meaning for us today. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray as we come to this time of invitation that we would freely come to your altar and seek your face. Lord, I pray for the one here who is hurting and suffering today. Maybe they're grieving a loss. Lord, would you just comfort them? I pray for the one father who needs to know you. God, would you draw them by your spirit to you? Lord, you have your way in this place during this time of invitation. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.